ಅಖಂಡಮಂಡಲಾಕಾರಂ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತಿ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಸಂಡೇ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸತ್ಸ ಟುಡೇ ಅವರ್ ನ್ಯೂಡೆಲ್ಲಿ ಬ್ರಾಂಚ್ ದ ಸೆಕ್ರೆಟ್ರಿ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ವೀಕ್ಸ್ ಯು ವಾಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೀ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀ ಟು ಟೇಕ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಸಂಡೇ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕಮ್ ಆನ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ದಟ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಗಾನ್ ಟು ಔರಂಗಾಬಾದ್ ಟು ಅಟೆಂಡ್ ಟು ಎ ವೆರಿ ಬಿಗ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮಿಷನ್ a grand temple has been inaugurated that is on 17 that is yesterday you know yesterday was a great auspicious occasion of sri jagadhatri puja so on that puja day the temple has been inaugurated and our vice president maharaj is were there and our delhi swami swami shantatpan ji was the main pujari there so he did the puja and uh, did the pran pratishtha i should say for the masters beautiful uh, pictures there so today i do not know what i am going to speak but then somebody reminded me that during my last speech on deepavali i was speaking about the concept of mother kali as capital t capital i capital m capital e as the time and how mother kali's iconography details as we see in the pictures drawn by the artist we find there are certain peculiar ways mother kali has been depicted and can those things be explained that is what i went into the details last week and on deepavali at that time somehow i have said that uh, next week if i have time i will speak to you about mahalakshmi so today the topic somebody reminded me that maharaj your topic is on mahalakshmi he said okay it's all right if mahalakshmi wants something to be said and heard it will be done because her will is the supreme will how this mahalakshmi talk came you know it's very interesting mahalakshmi is associated with our holy mother sri sarada devi there is a beautiful uh, bengali bhajan which we all relish when it is sung you know and it's a lilting tune also has been given to that song boy kunta teke ಲೋಕಿ ಎಲ್ಲೋ ಪೃಥ್ವೀತೆ ಮಾಠೀತೆ ಜಯರಾಮ್ ಬಾಟೀತೆ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಸಾಂಗ್ ಜಯರಾಮ್ ಬಾಟಿ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಪೋರ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪೃಥ್ವಿ ವೇರ್ ಲೋಕಿ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ ಹರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವೈಕುಂಠ ಸೊ ವೈಕುಂಠ ಈಸ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆಸಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ and lakshmi descended on this earth prithivite matite that is on this piece of land in the earth and where the name of the village was jayaram bati so it's very a beautiful song and it shows that how being the goddess of the wealth she was born into a poorest of the poor family in that village though she was poor economically yet she had such a large heart from childhood we can see how lakshmi grew in her personality so we find what is the meaning of lakshmi we come to that word lakshmi and we all know that lakshmi is one of the three three murtis of feminine characters of parvati lakshmi saraswati who are they 
according to the Puranas, these three deities are the co-existence with other three deities of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Brahma's Shakti is represented as Saraswati and Vishnu's Shakti is represented as Lakshmi and Shiva's Shakti is represented as Parvati or Kali, whatever name you give. Now these three Shaktis coexisting with the three powers that be run this universe, create this universe, subsist this universe and then finally dissolve this universe. So it is wonderful to see that creation, sustenance and destruction. Now these are three words that we often use for the universe. How this universe was created? A very good question comes up in one of the Upanishads and the disciples and the Guru discuss about the creation of this universe. How this could have come up? Such a big universe vastly expanding every moment. And what is the basis of this universe? Does it, was it created now, this is the question raised. You are seeing something. Well, if it is not created, you cannot see. Something has been created. That's why I am seeing this. If the glass I am seeing today, it's been the glass has been created. If it has not been created at all, if there is nothing as glass, then I would not be seeing any glass. Since I am seeing and recognizing my cognitive abilities, are now awakened and I am recognizing the objects of this universe, then these have been created. So there is a first basis that we put it. After that, was it a creation? What is the meaning of creation? So the word used in Sanskrit is something, a different word from the creation. We use very commonly in Hindi also, Bengali also, in all vernaculars, one word for creation, and that is Srishti. But actually speaking, Srishti doesn't mean creation. Srishti means emanation, or bringing up, or developing. What is already there? That is called Srishti, Srijate, Srijan. So it is not a creation. What is the meaning of English word creation is that you sit in one place and you have some tools within you and with the tools and you do something and create. So some basic raw material is required. For creation three things are required. Basic raw material and then the person who is going to create and the situation where it is created, a place where it is created. Now, these are these three things are available in the universe creation. So, is there anybody single person who sat at one place and started creating? With what he created? The question comes. So, what was the raw material that he had to create this universe? If the raw material was already there, so our Upanishads question, if it was already there, who created that raw material? So you say that another person created. Then that another person had some raw material with that he created this raw material. Then who created that raw material? So it is, the question goes on and on without finding any solution. Finally, you don't find any solution. So, that theory of creation is said to be not going anywhere. It only takes you round and round and round. So, it does not bring any solution. So, the Upanishad sages, they found this cannot be a solution. Then, what can be the solution? Can this be like this? Is a self-created Srijati, the word comes there, Srij, self-created. How can anything be self-created? 
in this universe what all we saw can you say as something has come on its own without any parents has there anything that comes out like that can anything be created in this universe then you find that yes there is something so the upanishad rishi says have you not seen the the spider net how the spider net comes out a very big spider net you can see when i was in south africa today i am happy that two devotees from south africa have also joined today in our audience and when i went to south africa and some of the uh, places like our uh, game reserves where you know wild beasts are there that game reserves in you can see in big trees under the tree a very big spider net is there huge spider net spanning this bigger than this room spider net so such big spider nets from where did they where did it come up it all came from the mouth of the spider the spider takes out its saliva and creates a dot and then puts the dot and it just moves on hanging stuck stuck into that dot and then it goes on extending it and puts it in another place and then it comes out back and then goes on making a net it is something wonderful if you see youtube video of uh, how the spider makes a net you will be stunned to see the whole net has come out from the spider's mouth and finally the spider dies there it is caught in the net and it dies there so it catches its prey also through the net and then it also dies there so if something can happen like this cannot have this universe also come out like that from the self it has come out and then self it goes up so it can be can you say srishti sthiti vinasha now now if this also has to be done the spider is being run by some other power it is not that spider has got all power it can only create a a net only where it can stay it is its house that it creates it cannot create a tree it cannot create a fruits so there are so many elements of creations that so many things are done then this cannot come on its own so the question the thinking goes on evolving and it said there must be something as the first being which must be rational because without the first being nothing can come so there must be something which can be called the first being which is called adi so the adi must be there so though we say the universe has, is anadi because it has got no beginning if it has got no beginning from where it came the upanishads say that the brahma when he started creating he created this universe from as he did in the past so in the past also there was creation and there was dissolution so swami vivekananda raises this point in gyana yoga and examines this issue of creation and he tells us very clearly in the modern english language so that we can understand it how he puts it he says that this creation and sustenance and destruction is a cyclic order it is not a one time affair if you say that universe has been created and then it will be go at to the end and it will be all over it is not like that if it is over it must come out also so the evolution theory swami ji accepts to some extent after that he says the evolution theory does not have answer for the further evolution say we all have become from amoeba we have come to the level of human beings very good so after this what is this evolution that evolution is cannot answer because they say it is not scientific to answer you can only prove it then only you can answer if you cannot prove and just imagine something that you cannot give it as a scientific answer so the scientists refuse to say what will happen next but you can see 
that what is going to happen. So our Hindu sages have said that evolution as a physiological evolution has come to a stop. Then what evolution is going to take place? Then our sages say there will be further evolution in psychological, social evolution will be there. So there will be psychological evolution which will lead ultimately to spiritual evolution. That is what we believe. Now you see what I'm, why I am brought this is this Srishti word though it is translated loosely as creation it is not creation because it cannot be created as we understand the meaning of the word creation. So it has been something already there which has been which has come out again. So the best translation of the word Srishti is emanation. It comes out. It was there. The light was there. It comes out. So a seed has sprouted into a small plant and then it becomes a very big tree. So a big tree you find in many places in India and elsewhere, we have got huge trees, say banyan trees. How big banyan trees are there? If you go to Calcutta, you can go to the botanic garden there and see the banyan tree. Huge tree. 600 years it is living. So like that people say in one one place, in America also they say one banyan tree 600 years, like that they say. So huge trees have come out. From where it came out? It came out from a seed. So Swamiji argues that if a seed can produce a big tree, the power to manifest as a big tree must be inherent within the seed. This is very scientific argument. Everybody accepts this, yes. The power of evolution, if you go on talking about evolution, you must understand the power of evolution must be inherent earlier. Then only the emanation can come out. So that is, the word he uses is involution. Evolution versus involution. If there is no involution, evolution cannot take place. That is what Swamiji says. It is a very beautiful idea. So there is an involved when we say involved, that means what? Inside it is remaining. So that involution is there. Involution precedes evolution. So evolution cannot just come up like that. So the Srishti, Siti, Vinasha, this cyclic order continues for how many million years we do not know. Because time itself is anadi. Now, at some point, you have to come to a conclusion that is, there must be one power which has created. And that power is called Adi. So that Adi must be there. That Who is that Adi? If you search for that, then you inquire. Either Jnana Yoga or Bhakti Yoga or Raj Yoga or Karma Yoga. Whatever Yoga you follow, you start finding out what is the source of this universe. Why I am born? Who am I? Like that you start questioning, then your spirituality has begun. At that time only, you try to understand what is this universe. Otherwise, we are all born, we live, we die. Again, according to our Hindu philosophy, we will, re we will be reborn, we will live, we will die. Like that, millions of births we have taken, millions of deaths we have taken. Until we realize ourselves as who I am, till that time I have no stoppage of this cyclic order going on. So once I realize that I am that self, I am that God, then all this further births and deaths are stopped. So that is called moksha. So these four moksha, four purusharthas are given to Hindus. And that is one is dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So moksha is the final outcome. After that, there is no other living. Means living of the temporary living is not there. Then we go into a eternal living. So this eternity comes, that idea comes, that is transcending the time, you go into a concept which is called eternity and where you stay on. Because you are never born, so you cannot die. Because you have never died, so you live on. So that is how the eternity concept comes. 
So this is called moksha, liberation. Liberation from the cycle of birth and death. Now you see, why all these philosophical things I am telling you is to find the word Lakshmi, the root of the word is from the Laksh. Laksh means aim, goal. Do you have any goal in your life? Can you focus your life on some point where you can think that I would like to find out what is the origin of me? Then that is called Lakshya. And the grace of divine personality which allows you, which makes you practice certain spiritual discipline and go into search of who you are and that divine personality is imagined by your rishis as a Devi, a Lakshmi. So this Lakshmi is itself a concept originally but then it has become real. That is called, that's why it's called mythology. What is a myth? And somebody said a myth is something which is non-existing but has become real. So it is something imaginary. <clears throat> okay, a myth can be imaginary but then somebody imagined it but then it has become real now and that is called mythology. So in mythology of Lakshmi you find that Lakshmi is brought out from the churning of the ocean. Was she created? No. There was no one. If you say created, then the defects of the creative action will be imposed upon her. Because if you say created, who is the creator? The question will come. But here there is no creator. They were only churning the ocean. What does that mean, churning the ocean? The story is very nice. In one of the Puranas, we find that, uh, that Devas and Asuras go into a fight. Of course, in all the Puranas, we will have this repetition, these Devas and Asuras fighting. And in one of the fighting, they were, both of them were demanding that Amrita that should be given to us. So, the solution was the Amrita is not anywhere accessible. It is in the deep recess of the ocean. So, you cannot even enter that place. So, how do you get it? Then, the suggestions came that the ocean, if it can be churned, then one by one things will come out. <clears throat> yes. So, the self-knowledge, seeking of self-knowledge, which will give me eternal life, is called Amrita. What is the meaning of Amrita? We say nectar. The nectar word doesn't give that exact meaning. It's an English word again. You see, English has got certain, a certain inadequacies in expressing certain ideas. For instance, our Hindi, Bengali, our vernacular languages of India, they are much more powerful than the, sub, the language English. Because, you know, English developed as a, as a business language, as a conqueror's language everywhere. So, as a business language, it has become very well. But when you come to spiritual ideas of the Eastern religions, you find English is finding difficulty. So, when you use certain English words, nectar, it doesn't mean anything to you. What is it? Nectar means eternal life. Like that you have to explain. But the Sanskrit word for nectar is amritam. Amrita. Amrita means what? Dead. Gone away. Amrita means not going away. You are living all the time. That is called eternity. So that amrit, that search for self-knowledge, which will give you eternity, that eternity is in the mind. So I have to search in the mind. How do I search? You go in deep into the recess of this ocean. Ocean full of water, disturbing waters, so many, uh, so many uh, waves and it is never peaceful. And that, even in that inside, so many animals are there. It's a terrible thing if you see the undersea exhibitions in Singapore we have got a museum there undersea and when you go there you can see that how many types of creatures are there under the sea. We are already 
overwhelmed seeing outside or above the sea level but under the sea also huge number is there and there you see that all these things are there so under the sea what is mind in nothing but like a ocean where so much of disturbances are there our mind swami vivekananda explains our mind as at three levels are there one is conscious level underneath the subconscious level and underneath is the level called unconscious level he says the conscious level is level now we are all aware suppose suddenly i ask you where are you sitting you will say i am sitting at sarada auditorium in ramakrishna mission new delhi center this is you are very well knowing it if i ask you where are you you will not think about that because you are knowing that who is speaking in front of you if i ask you you will immediately say who is speaking in front of you you know the name because you are here now now this is these thoughts this is called vrittis in sanskrit vritta means circle these thoughts are to be in the formation of a circle it comes it goes it comes a cyclic order only can do like that even if you take a straight line as swami ji says in science also says if you take a straight line there cannot be a straight line in this world if the straight line starts from here it goes like this straight and straight and straight and straight and straight finally it will have to come and meet this straight line at the left side because this is a round thing where it started it has to end there so there is no such as straight line the horizon we see that it is as if it is straight it is not so from up you go from the nasa the photographs of the globe you take and you see it's all round round none of the grahas none of the <coughs> other things are not round everything is round even the water you take the water and pour it and take drops of water from here one drop comes immediately it becomes a round shaped <coughs> so the round is the nature because it starts and then comes out so vritti our all our vrittis are starting and going around and then coming back so arising and then subsiding and again rearising that is the nature of the thoughts so they are called vrittis these vrittis vedanta says they are in our conscious mind where i am living where i am what i am listening now like that all these thoughts are there these are called conscious level of your mind but underneath there is another level which is called subconscious level what is this subconscious level there are some vrittis that is thoughts strands of thoughts we can say which are lying there but now i am not aware of it <clears throat> say you are sitting here listening to me you are not aware of certain thoughts for instance i ask you specifically which school did you pass out in your school final examination you have never thought about the school for the last 20 years perhaps but today when i am asking that immediately you give the reply so and so school i studied maharaj like that you say so that the where was that thought so long you are not thought thought about it you are never thought about it but then the thought is there so it came out so where was it if it can be retrieved it can be taken out it can be remembered very easily and then that thought must be living at the subconscious level <clears throat> so there are many many thoughts in our mind which are hidden in subconscious level not in the forefront not in the conscious level but hidden in the subconscious level and that subconscious level thoughts are there if you want you can take it out <clears throat> now come to certain other thoughts for instance i ask you what was your previous birth will you be able to remember there are people who remember their previous births the shanti uh, uh, thing was very famous in india long back when i was a student i used to hear about that in up one girl five year old girl remembered her past birth and she could tell the names of her husbands brothers and sisters and in laws and which village everything she told and when they found it everything was tallied so in all over the world we find the remembrance of the past birth come to very few people yes 
So if I ask you now, will you remember that? You don't remember. Normally we don't remember our past births. So where is that thought lying? Those are lying in the unconscious level. That means to retrieve any thought, to take out any thought which is you are finding difficulty. Sometimes you are scratching your head. Hey, I cannot remember that. Where did I see this man? So by scratching your head, you are thinking that thought will come. Because this is a level, <laughs> subconscious level, you are tapping. No, it doesn't come. Why it doesn't come? Because it is much more deeper level. And now the deeper level, Swamiji calls it a glass without any bottom. Imagine a glass without any bottom. So Swamiji calls it bottomless pit is our, our unconscious level. So there is an unconscious level within us which has got no bottom. Why no bottom, Swamiji says? Because there is no first birth we cannot identify. Where was the first birth? We do not know. Millions of births we have gone undergone. Even if you take the evolution theory as true, from amoeba we have taken to this human birth, how many births it has gone? Millions and millions of births. And all those thoughts are lying in our mind. They have not been released or removed from the mind. They are only forgotten. Forgotten means what? That for the present, I am not remembering. But the thoughts are there. That's why sometimes you see, hey, this, this uh, place I went, I went to Myanmar. You know, in Myanmar, we have a Ramakrishna mission. Very old center was there. Swami Ranganathananji was the head of that center. So I went to see that center. And the center is there, the building is there, the board is there, Ramakrishna mission, including our monogram is there. But we are not there. Because in 1965, the, when the military took over the country, they sent us out. So we all came out. And it is being run by a small uh, local committee that is running it. So when I went there and moving around the city, I could feel the city is well known to me. Somehow I felt that this city is, I got a connection with this city. How did I think like that? Certain things were seemed to be very well known to me. I could just walk like this. And then I said, I had a hunch, if I turn left in this road, I will see a Buddhist temple. And when there, I saw a Buddhist temple. So that, what is that hunch? It says, in the unconscious level, the thoughts of your previous experiences are stored. And if conducive circumstances are there, then those thoughts can be also brought out. So sometimes we get this type of feelings. Yes, I knew this. I knew this person earlier. I have seen him somewhere. Like that we think. So the subconscious level and unconscious level you'll find these thoughts are there. Why I brought this is that when this is like a abyss, that is what the word Swamiji uses. This bottomless pit, he calls it abyss. This is a beautiful English word. A B Y double S. Abyss. So this abyss, that is what the Samudra Mantan shows. This mind is full of conscious, subconscious, and unconscious level thoughts, we do not know where the deep recess that uh, Amrita is there. What is that Amrita here? It is the seeking for self-knowledge, which will give you eternal life. So you go there. Now it can't be taken out just like that because you do not know where it is lying and how much depth it is. So what the best way is, churn the mind. So you bring a yeah, Mandara Parvat. Have you seen Mandar Parvat? It is very nearby only. Near Bhagalpur, if you go, you can see the Mandar Parvat. So I, when I went there, they, all the local people were telling, Swamiji, this is that Parvat that was used in that. Oh, so far away from ocean. Now they have kept it in near Bhagalpur, you know. So that Mandar Parvat is there. And how did you get a rope to do it? You have to bring Vasuki. See, the Puranas, if you stay, take it as a mere stories, it, they are mere stories for you. That's why myth has got a meaning. If you understand the meaning and try to explore within yourself, each one is allowed to explore according to his natural tendencies, according to his knowledge at the particular position of his life. He is free to explore Puranas. 
So when you explore Puranas, what you would find is, this Vasuki, this snake, what it is? Snake is my, that I, where I am there. So the snake comes, I. This I is what, with which that I am going to do this. What is the Mandara Parvat? Mandara Parvat is my body, the stool body. So this physical body is the Parvat. Over that, I put that I as a rope and then start doing churning within the recess of the deepest recess of my unconscious mind. Then what happens? So many things are coming out. You'll be surprised. The Puranas depict how many things came out. And one of the objects was Lakshmi also. She was also coming out from that. Finally, she, she, was, she stands there and then every Devatas are looking at her. Such a marvelous beauty they have never seen. That's why she is called Sri. Sri means beauty. It is something unimaginable. That beautiful woman form, she is standing there, Purana say. And then she is asked whom she would like to have a husband. And she chooses Mahavishnu. And she, Mahavishnu takes her as his Bharya, as his wife. Now the Puranic languages are like that, which is very understandable for humans. But you must go into deeper into that and find out what is the meaning of these things. What is Lakshmi? That when you find that eternal search is coming out and that is the wealth of a human being. What is your Nidhi? Nidhi means wealth. What is your wealth? What is she for you? The beauty of your personality is search for spiritual life. If spiritual life is not your goal, Lakshya, then Lakshmi is not going to come to you. We should never misunderstand Lakshmi only indicating the physical wealth like money, like property, like uh, other objects of uh, enjoyment. No. That is also included in Lakshmi. But then Lakshmi represents much more than that. She is the spiritual ideal. As you, I said, was talking about the creation and sustenance and destruction, that's why I, first I told you that Srij, that Srijati, Srishti, is not something that started today and then tomorrow it will be over. It's coming from beginning to beginning to beginning and who is the beginning, we do not know. So, who is the beginning? So, the Vaishnavas, those who believe in the Lord Vishnu as the supreme deity, they say, Adi Mulam is Narayana. The very word Narayana signifies that. Naranam, Nara, Ayanaha, the, the path. For all entire humanity, there is a path taking us to the ultimate realization and that is Narayana. And where does Narayana stay? Yes, Narayana stays in Vaikuntha as per Puranas. Yes, Vaikuntha, very good. That's also a beautiful word, Vaikuntha. Kunta means, you know, Sankuchan. You get yourself a shrunk. That is called Kunta. Vaikuntha is Visesha Kunta. What is this Visesha Kunta? The entire universe is going to get merged finally at the dissolution time, at the dissolution time. That's why it's called Vaikuntha. So we are all going to stay in Vaikuntha, whether you want it or not. Because we have to come again. When the world will be recreated by Brahma, then we all have to come again. So we all will go into that place. So that's why it's called Vaikuntha. So there Vaikuntha, and we imagine like Vaikuntha is some like a Swarga, and where Vishnu is there with Lakshmi, and after my death I will go there and stay with the Lord. That's very good as a as a Vishnu believer, as a devotee, that's a very good idea. But that is not a philosophical idea. But this Vaikuntha, we say that Vishnu is there. So Lakshmi is there. So if you want to have the Lakshya, Prapti, then you have to reach Narayana. And Narayana is a deity. Brahma is a deity. Like Shiva is a deity. Now these three deities, if you find, I am developing the 
scope of my discussion to bring out who is Lakshmi. Where is the role of Lakshmi comes here? These deities are, you know, funny thing is about our Hinduism, the others say, is they cannot come to reconcile the existence of too many gods and goddesses. You know, our modern children, when they go to their schools, colleges, universities, and in a multi-racial, multi-religious societies that is evolving everywhere, you are not alone in one place. If a next door neighbor will be a Christian, next door another next door neighbor will be a Muslim, next door neighbor will be Jain, next door neighbor will be a Buddhist, like that. In South Africa, we all live like that. It's a multiracial society. So when I went to South Africa first time, you know, in Chennai where I was there, maximum we are all Hindus only. So we had no problem with interacting with the people. We know that you are a Hindu, I am a Hindu, you are a believer. Perhaps you are believe in Vishnu, I am believe in Shiva, like that we used to think. But when I came to South Africa, I could understand what a multiracial society, not religious even, race, race itself. In India, we are all very comfortable with Indians seeing everywhere. But you go to a place where Indians you see less. You go to Johannesburg or you go to Cape Town, hardly you see an Indian. And so much of other races you will find. So multiracial, that type of societies are cropping up everywhere in the world, wherever you go. And multiracial, not only multiracial, multi-religious societies are coming up. And our children are studying. In South Africa, our children, our Hindu children are studying in schools with who are their friends. Black children are their friends, white children are their friends, colored children are their friends. So they don't feel any difference among themselves. As students of the school, only when they grow up and when the parents start injecting the poison of separation, then only they come to know. Otherwise, children, they are quite happy playing among themselves. So, why I'm telling is, when these multiracial, multi-religious societies, when you come up, the questions are raised. So when you go to a college, and in a multi-religious college, where all the types of students are there, and when you are talking to your own classmates, and taking tiffin, and they suddenly they ask, hey, in your religion, why so many gods? Why not one god? What do you answer? That boy doesn't know any answer. He comes back and asks his parents. Well, parents cannot tell any answer because they themselves don't know. They have never raised this question. As a Hindu, you just find out introspectively, have you ever raised the question, why so many gods? Because we are born with that psyche. We have been treated and trained in the past births, so many past births, we knew all these answers. Perhaps I may not have the answers straight in the conscious level. But if I am told to explain, then I will slowly I can explain it. And we never question that. Why so many gods in a temple you go? There are too many gods are there. Why there are so many? You never question that. But for coming from another type of religion, where one god has been propagated, they find it very strange. And you can't answer properly. The confusion comes much more when you use the English language. I am not blaming the English language because I am using the English language. Language is Saraswati, you know. So Saraswati's grace is required for talking. But why I am telling you it is inadequate. How it is inadequate, I am telling you one example. That example is that God, a word God is very often we use. Now, if you go into Sanskrit literature and Vedanta literature, that very God there is no translation of the word God in our language. Konse shabda aap prayo karenge? God is shabda ka. Aap soch lije. Suppose I say, there is only one existence, supreme God, which is called Parabrahman. Can I use that Parabrahman word wherever God is used? No. Because, Parabrahman doesn't act. It has got no gunas. It is nirguna. It has got no rupa. It is nirakara. When nirakara, nirguna, parabrahman, it just lives. It just is. 
Sat. It is called Sat. It just is. That's all. It lives. That's all. And there is no name for that. So if you say Parabrahman created this universe, Hindus will laugh. Parabrahman cannot do anything. It just stays. But in English you say God creates this universe. You can use that. And God doesn't create the universe also. You can use the word God. But here you can't use that. That Parabrahman by the association of time becomes Parameshwara. So Parameshwara is the next. Even the Parabrahman, there are two types of Parabrahman. That becomes Parameshwara. Parameshwara is classified into two categories. One is Nirguna Nirakara Ishwara. Another is Saguna Sakara Ishwara. Now this Saguna Sakara Ishwara, this Ishwara actually creates, runs and dissolves this universe. Not the Parabrahman. And this Saguna Sakara Ishwara, which is called, say, we Parameshwara, we call it, and that Ishwara only creates. So if you say God creates, and if you say that Ishwara creates, it's quite matching. But God creates when you say, if you say Parabrahman creates, then it is not matching. And also, this uh, Ishwara, when he assumes the work of creation, <coughs> he manifests himself as a deity, as a worshipful deity called Lord Brahma. And when he assumes another form of running this universe, that is sustenance, then he gets the name as Vishnu. And when he, the world is dissolved, at that time, the same Parameshwar assumes another proportion, another dimension, which is called Mahadev or Shiva. So these three deities are actually one only. Parameshwara only comes as Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. But then, in English, you don't have any separate words. You use the same G-O-D for Param Brahman to up to Bhagavan. So who is Bhagavan now? Bhagavan is that deity or that power which sustains this universe. So Bhagavan ne kya kya dekho? Bhagavan ne humko aisa rakha. Am log jo achit mein bolte hain. So what is this Bhagavan? That Ishwara, when you approach that Ishwara in a devotional attitude, then you call that Ishwara as a Bhagavan. That Bhagavan only takes avatars, mind you, not that Parabrahman. But Parabrahman has got no action. But originally Parabrahman is there. From Parabrahman only the emanation are, is happening. And these emanations are drawing us into different streams. And those different streams are named, specific names are given in our languages. But English doesn't have the equal words. So when you say, God, itne gods kyo hai? Pushne se, humko bhi aashir lagta hai. Kaha itne gods hai? Ye sab gods hum loo dikta hai. Ye sab to ye ki god hai. Parabrahman se to sab aya. Like that we always imagine that. So, one supreme being we also accept. That is our motto. From that, there are different, different manifestations of God we find. So, the deities are there. And much worse happens when the word God is used even for the devatas. You know, devatas are like us only. They are also created beings like us. We humans are one category. Like that, devatas are also one category. Bhutas are also one category. Pishachas are one category. Like that, 18 categories are there. Devi Mahatma, if you read the Durga Kavacham, there it says, after telling so many categories of beings, it says etc. So how many categories, we do not know. The rishis have not counted. But you see, it's so many innumerable ca categories are there. Created beings, these are all. Like humans have come up, like that, these devatas also come up. Kinnaras are there, Gandharvas are there. Like all these are all categories of beings. Now, these devatas are also translated in English as gods. Now, how much confusion you see it can create? So, Agni, Varuna, Indra, they are all considered as gods. And then, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva are also considered as gods. And then, the, their feminine representation is called goddesses. So, with these words, actually there is no feminine concept also. If you see our Vedanta, 
Vedanta defines these things in a very beautiful way that the power of the deity can be imagined as a feminine form. <clears throat> that means, why feminine form? The power acts. The basis of the power does not act. That is the simple uh, reason. The Vedanta says, Brahman doesn't act. But Brahma Shakti acts. So this entire creation has not come out of Brahman. It has been created or activated by Brahma Shakti. Then is the Brahma Shakti different from the Brahman? This question comes up in the Gospel and Sri Ramakrishna explains, no, it is not different. It is not different. It is like the diamond and its dazzling power, milk and its whiteness. So he says, the snake which is sleeping, lying there on the ground and sleeping, that is Brahman. And when the snake starts moving, that is Shakti. So the movement and this keeping quiet, these two are considered. So they are not part and part, you cannot separate it. So Sri Ramakrishna says, Brahman and its power cannot be separated. That's why Narayana and Lakshmi cannot be separated. So when we new couple comes for Pranam, when we, we give them uh, Ashir Vachan, we say, be thou like Lakshmi Narayan, we say. Why? Lakshmi Narayan never got separated. It can't be separated because the power of the person cannot be separated. You are a judge. Suppose you are a judge and sitting in the court and you are taking up a case and you are writing a judgment. That judgment writing, the judgment giving is inherent with you or not. If you don't have that power, you cannot be a judge. Likewise, a teacher teaching students, her teaching is her inherent power. Likewise, a doctor who is prescribing. A doctor listens to your ailments and doesn't give you prescribes any medicines. Said, go away. That means he has not used his power. So that power of giving prescriptions, that is called power. That power is not different from the person who is wielding the power. So God's and his, their powers, the powers are imagined by your rishis as a feminine, as a mother. That's why they were called divine mother. So we have Divine Mother Lakshmi, Divine Mother Saraswati, Divine Mother Parvati, Divine Mother Durga, Divine Mother Kali, and innumerable Divine Mothers you can have. No problem at all. Because all these are all powers of some, their related deity. So that's how Lakshmi comes here. So when Mahalakshmi comes, and Mahalakshmi, when Holy Mother was... Uh, uh, was uh, uh, just after marriage... She was all alone in Kamar Pukur, in Jairambati. She used to go for taking bath. And in the early morning, she used to go for bath. And suddenly she would see eight girls, divine girls used to come with her, accompany her. Because she was afraid to go all alone. And these girls would come with her. So she told that, who are these girls? Somebody asked. So Holy Mother said, they are Ashtalakshmis. Think of Ashtalakshmi. I will give you a briefly... What is this Ashtalakshmi? The same Lakshmi goddess, this Mahalakshmi, is manifesting in eight different ways. And if you see that eight different ways, the first is called Adi Lakshmi, second is Dhana Lakshmi, third is Dhanya Lakshmi, and fourth is Gaja Lakshmi. So out of eight, four I have told you. The rest four you may know. If you don't know, then I'll repeat. The fifth is Santana Lakshmi. Sixth is Veera Lakshmi. And seventh is Vijaya Lakshmi. And eighth is Vara Lakshmi. In South India, in homes you will find Vara Lakshmi Vratam is there. See how Lakshmi is worshipped in different places in India, in different forms. In Lakshmi worship during Diwali time you find in western side. And in the eastern side, the Diwali, same Diwali I told you, it is Kali Puja, not Lakshmi Puja. But Lakshmi Puja is sometimes, sometime later, separately they do Lakshmi Puja. Kojagari Purnima they call it. In Bengalis they call it Kojagari. So Lakshmi comes out in the night and goes around. Who is sleeping? 
who is awake. See, the lakshya has to be reached. For that, you have to be remaining awakening. If there is no awakening, so people, what do they do? To keep awake, you put on some cinema and then see, goes on seeing. But that is not meant for that originally. The lakshya is to reach my innermost recess of my heart and find out who I am. That is the lakshya. That's why Lakshmi comes. And she comes and goes on, see, ko jagari. She is asking, who is awake? Who is awake? Like that she says. And who is awake? To that person, she gives her blessings. Like that we have a Aitiju. Uh, <clears throat> then now you find these eight Lakshmis, you find are eight types of development of human personality. I will put it like that. Introspectively, I sometimes think, why these eight Lakshmis they have given? Why not nine Lakshmis? Nava Lakshmis they could have given like Nava Durgas. Why not seven Lakshmis, Sapta Lakshmis, like Sapta Kanyas? They did not give, only eight they have given. So there must be some correlation between each Lakshmi to this Lakshmi to that Lakshmi. Say for instance, Adi Lakshmi. Adi Lakshmi means the prime evil. That is the original, the, that creative force. That is called Adi Lakshmi. So now I have been created by her. I am a human being now. Somehow I have come into being. Now I have to look for what is my Lakshya. My Lakshya is spiritual liberation, emancipation or moksha is my Lakshya. So now I have to think, how do I go about it? So after the Adi Lakshmi, where by yeah, whose grace now I have been created and have come into this world, now I should proceed for Dhanam, Artha. Artha must be there. Dharma, Artha. So the Artha I have to now take. Without this money, without this wealth, what I will do in this world? <clears throat> if you don't have proper money, even in this world, staying, living itself is very difficult. <clears throat> How many poor people we see? How much of poverty is there? Money is not there. So wealth is not there. <clears throat> but as I told you, <clears throat> there is another meaning of the wealth is different types of gunas. Sadgun. These are all wealth. So that wealth also, if it is not there, your life is vain. So this wealth, Dhana Lakshmi comes. But if I have wealth and I am born and I have lot of wealth and if I don't have health, will I be able to stay in this life? It is vain. Only I am spending all the money on the medical expenses. What is the use? So, Dhanya Lakshmi comes. Where Dhanya means all the uh, all the uh, herbs. herbs. So these herbs are giving us health. So that I should have not only wealth, I should have healthy life. Dhanna Lakshmi. Then I have wealth and I have a healthy life. Is it enough? If you do not have a status in a society, <clears throat> you are a belonging to a society and the society would like to have your status and they would like to know you how many houses you have. How much money you have? What uh, prosperity that you have gained in this life? It will recognize you by the status. So Gaja Lakshmi. In those days, big kings used to keep Gaja. Gaja means elephant. So how many elephants you have? So this is a status. So status also you gain. After gaining status, having wealth and good health, what are you going to do if you die? You cannot transfer to the next generation. If you do not have progeny, so Santana Lakshmi. So when you worship Lakshmi, she gives a Santana. That is, you carry on the tradition of your uh, religion to the next batch. So Santana Lakshmi is very important. And after the Santana Lakshmi, Veera Lakshmi comes. So with this Santana, then you start working with the Rajas, full of activity. And that is requires Veerata to to meet all types of challenges that you get in this life. It's very difficult. Because you've got all these four, your life is very peaceful, it is not so. Plenty of challenges will come in the life. How are you going to meet those challenges? So the virata must be there. Or dhairya. Vira or dhairya. That must be there. So you approach that way. And then you get vijaya. Then only you get success. After this success, then who is the Lakshmi 
who has come out in these seven forms and she is called vara lakshmi she is ready to give you whatever you ask vara means boon whatever boon you ask lakshmi is ready to give and this eight lakshmi is put together is called mahalakshmi and that mahalakshmi we worship as i told you last time in south africa there are seven sub centers and i used to go all these sub centers and several groups and i have seen even children chant this mahalakshmi ashtakam sarva siddhim avapnoti mahalakshmi prasadatah it ends like that it starts like namoste stu mahalakshmi like that it starts namoste stu mahamaye shri pite sura pujite shanka chakra gada haste mahalakshmi namostute like that one by one stanza comes it all ends with mahalakshmi namostute like that eight times and then final the concluding verse says that yappate uh, no bhakti man naraha that whoever bhakti man whoever sings this song whoever reads this song that is him that person sarva siddhi mavapnoti very clearly that sage says sarva siddhi success in everything so if you have any problem in family life the best verse is mahalakshmi i have seen mahalakshmi ashtakam has been read before me after my telling by the devotees and they have progressed in their life all types of siddhi sarva siddhi mavapnoti mahalakshmi prasadatah by her grace all the success you get what a beautiful verse it is only eight verses this also we find it difficult to read you know and if you can read it every day and it is such a wonderful effect that we have so these are the some of the ideas that i could share with you mahalakshmi this is such a wonderful our whole vedantic thought takes us to think about our gods and goddesses in a new way and that is what i find it most scientific and most satisfying to me so with these words i take leave of you om shanti 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 hari om tat sat sri ramakrishna arpanam astu